This is History is Here to Help. Uh, title of our show is, uh, is, is the GOP a cult? But we're going to talk more about cults than the GOP. Uh, and we have Jean Rosenfeld here with us to discuss it. And she is a professor um, of cults. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Jean, give us a little about your background at uh, UCLA. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, all right, in graduate school, I first went to become an anthropologist. I got my MA and for various reasons stopped and had three kids. And then later I decided to go back to school because my brain was fried. And um, I took a degree in history, but a specific uh, part of history that's a social science from Europe called history of religions. And it's like sociology of religion in the United States. But I, I like the way historians write better than sociologists. I like the reading more. Yeah, so I, more facts of, in there. <laughs> I'm sort of like a sociologist of religion, but I'm really a historian. And my work, my subspecialties have put me into the area of political science in a way that I never ex expected to go into political science. So that's where I am now. I've noticed, I mean, our discussions with you, they always start, um, you know, with um, anthropology, sociology, history, and they wind up in political science, kicking and screaming. We can't, we can't protect from that. It, it, it's inevitable in every discussion these days, you know, because political science is really mm, the game. It's what's happening. It's now. It, it, the, and it's the dynamic that will, you know, direct the future, too. So um, I, I appreciate that. Uh, so today about cults, let's first, let, let's, the scope of the show would be, is the GOP a cult? But then uh, if the GOP is a cult, you know, what is going on with cults? Are cults elsewhere? Um, because you could easily make the argument that cults are popping up hither and yon. Maybe it's always been the case. It certainly seemed the case with uh, uh, Jim Jones and, and uh, Jonestown in Guyana. Um, but um, aside from that, I don't, I don't remember actually confronting a cult in, our li in my lifetime, Jean. Um, but what, what should we know about cults? Is it, is it part of the, um, part of the uh, Im Im implicit quality of humanity? Well, I'm going to query the word cult as we use it today. Yeah, I think it is very unscholarly and it, it does not have any compelling analytic power, no rigor of theory behind it. There are far better uh, theories and far better uh, data that explain what people experience as cults. And it can be very damaging to apply the cult label to any non-normative religious group, because what could happen is what happened at Waco. And you could have a lot of dead people because you don't understand what you're dealing with. So that's how I got involved in the first place because people died at Waco. And uh, we formed an interdisciplinary national, now international new field of study of new religious movements. Respecting the GOP and the question, because what that's a whole story for another time. Is the GOP a cult? That's the label we apply to a group that we don't like, whose belief system and ideology we, we find repellent. It's a pejorative term. I can go with all of those things. They all work for me. <laughs> Okay, good. Now, to move on, what is, what is it? It's a movement that has taken over a political party. And the movement, if you, if you go back to 2015, when Trump was running for president and 2016, he never called, he never referred to the GOP or a party that he belonged to. He, re, he always referred to my movement. That was a tip off. He is a charismatic leader. He did not come up through the ranks. He did not earn uh, through experience his status. He achieved his status by virtue of 
a large group of people who saw him as a messiah type figure. There's a lot of work on messianism and millennialism and apocalypticism that now has entered our political scene. And I use those categories as far better explainers of, of what's happening to us than I have from the very beginning. So he is a charismatic leader with a plurality of voters. A plurality is a large number. And he emerged into the mainstream. We've had any number of charismatic leaders of groups that were violent in recent years, including uh, the signature group in 1985 called uh, The Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord, which was a Christian militant group, separated themselves from society, went into the Ozark Mountains, eventually converted to fascism and Aryan nation and Christian identity religion. And they set up a, uh, a, a whole training field for the coming apocalyptic war. Again, and it's a racial war. And that's where the idea of bombing the federal building first came up, is in that group. And they were led by a charismatic leader named Jim Ellison. And fortunately, there was an important person in that group called Carrie Noble, who was their propagandist. And after the, the group was confronted by the FBI and a very wise first leader of the hostage uh, rescue team, uh, uh, Danny Colson, he and Carrie worked together to dissolve this uh, confrontation with the FBI over an heavily armed group really bad and much worse than wake up. They did it in five days. Danny Colson was amazing. And so was Carrie Noble. Carrie Noble went on. This is a- oh, Wait, wait, before you go past that, how did they do it in five days? What was the secret? <laughs> well, Carrie was a, a very, at a very high level in the group. As I said, he was the chief propagandist who spewed out all these uh, conspiracy theories and ideologies. And he had his family. These, these were families there. And he did not want violence. He did not want a, a, a conflagration. So he met with uh, Car he met with Danny Colson, and they agreed that James Ellison was not quite with it enough to try to talk to, so he negotiated. He went back and forth between the community and the FBI, and he got the job done. That's the important thing, he got the job done. And he tells us all about it in probably the most important book about any American so-called cult, and that is Tabernacle of Hate. And he wrote it all by himself. He'd never written a book before, and it's a classic in my field. Interesting. So what was the secret? Was it a matter of listening? Was it a matter of interpreting? Was it a matter of um, you know, some sort of psychological well, uh, interaction? You know, I was involved briefly, well, not briefly, for quite a long time, but, but I wasn't the only person involved. It's many, many people involved, including fellow scholars, uh, with the Montana Freeman standoff, which was the longest standoff uh, between a religious group and the FBI, 81 days. And we kept sending suggestions into the Department of Justice. But, and I wrote, I wrote up a whole analysis of that after it was over. The way it, it, these things come down usually is through negotiation, not through threat. And, you, and to negotiate, you have to find the people who can talk to them. And this goes back to charismatic leadership. Why does a charismatic leader suddenly emerge? Somebody like David Koresh is a charismatic leader. And he had base, he was dyslexic and he had a high school education. What was it about him that attracted people with doctorates to come from the United Kingdom? He had a message they wanted to hear. He was expert in the way he propounded that message. When followers come to a charismatic leader, they're getting something they want. It's a trade-off. The leader can communicate in their language to their basic concerns. Trump communicated to a very 
large group of millions of people who felt they'd been left behind and ignored in this country. And he did it brilliantly. He's no dummy. Yeah, well, but it's, 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 it's not an intellectual process for him. It's intuitive, right? He's a smart guy and, and his intuition tells him what he needs to do. It's, it's worse than that. It's a personality type. It starts in childhood. If you read about the childhood of Hitler and you read the childhood of Trump, uh, I don't have access to the childhood of Putin or Mussolini. Uh, it, uh, it's similar. Yeah. They're bullies. They're basically yeah. bullies, the bully yeah. type. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, charismatic leader. And we talked briefly before the show about what that is. Um, and, you know, it has, you know, for me, the word charismatic has a positive overtone to it. Yes. But you pointed out that that's really not so. What is a charismatic leader? It can be used for good or ill. Jesus was a charismatic leader. And so was Napoleon. And that impressed Max Weber, the founding sociologist. And he looked into it. And he wrote up a whole theory of charismatic leadership. And the guy comes from below. He doesn't come through the institutions. And he gains a followership that is uh, very, very devoted. And uh, they regard him as a fount of knowledge a knowledge that they're yearning for, but they can't find anywhere else, addressing their deepest concerns. So the deepest concern during Germany's time in, in, in the National Socialist rise was uh, the fact that the Weimar Republic wasn't working, that France had taken part of Germany, that the Versailles Treaty was not fair to them, but they were suffering from many uh, lack of pride and all sorts of things, humiliation. And Hitler spoke to that. He spoke to German pride. If you look at Lenny Riefenstahl's film, Triumph of the Will, about the Nuremberg uh, conference uh, that brought together the National Socialist Party before he achieved power, you will see that this is all positive for these people. It's very positive. It's, it's an Elmer Gantry thing. I'm going to bring you salvation. I am going to bring you the light. I know only I can fix it. Mm -hmm, I've heard I, that. I I am you. You are me. Identification. Oh. oh. Yeah. Je suis je suis vous. Je, uh, I am you. You are me. I I I'm in your head. Um, I've, I've heard that before too. As a matter of fact, there's a movie out now about a right wing group in Germany. Um, it's called uh, Je suis Carl. At first I thought, oh, he's, it's, he's saying his name is Carl. No, he's not saying that. He's saying, I am Carl. Um, Carl was the leader of the group, and that's what they chanted, I am Carl. So, you know, um, the problem is uh, that the charismatic leader you describe who, who fills a gap in people, many, many people, um, is a dynamic. Uh, let me let me throw a little of this on the fire, and that is power, which you get by being a charismatic leader, corrupts, and a lot of power corrupts a lot. And so uh, Hitler's message might have been, I, "I can I can help you deal with um, you know the failure of the Weimar Republic, and help you deal with the loss of land to France and the bad treaty after the war." Um, but somewhere along the line, it was dynamic. It changed, right? Isn't that part of the scenario we're talking about? Absolutely. You know, there's this whole argument about fascism. Is it the left or is it the right? Well, it's neither. It's more spiritual than political. It's more a religion than an ideology. It's, it's um, you know, they, they don't have a political ideology. Mussolini started out with women's rights in the labor movement. Ten years later, he wrote his apologia about fascism. He, he, he coined the term fascism. And he said, you know, I've been operating for 10 years and I, I really haven't thought about my politics. And he switched. He switched from being, you know, um, liberal to being... Um, extremely militaristic 
And uh, it, it also involves uh, um, heightened male virility symbols and procedures. If you remember Trump <laughs> in that ridiculous video where he was wrestling literally with CNN, and, you know, the icon with CNN on it, and where he was talking about Marco Rubio's size, that is typical of fascism. And I'm using the term not with a big F, you know, the big notion of I, I'm trying to score points or anything. I'm using the term as it really is and historically developed. And these guys have a lot in common. So it helps you identify whether this is guy's a fascist or not a fascist. You can identify him by his, his symbols and the way he acts. So does this mean that um, you can have a you can have a fellow who um, develops a message um, that that satisfies people and everybody's happy with that, but it doesn't stay in balance. Uh, that this individual uh, is interested in enhancing his power. Um, forgive me for not using there, but I'll use the <clears throat> the masculine. Um, that that he's going to look he's, to enhance his power, and he's going to look to take action against anybody who would oppose. You know, it's the picture of the autocrat. How, so how close is this that we're talking about? Um, the person who is the narcissistic, uh, charismatic leader, um, becoming a leader who, who attempts to destroy any adversary, any opposition. Again, I don't want to use charismatic, which after all comes from the Greek word charis, which means grace. <laughs> I don't want to label it as always negative. Some of the great leaders in human history have been charismatic, of course, Buddha. It comes to mind, Muhammad, Jesus. Um, these are all charismatic leaders. Um, there's a there. It's a dynamic, definitely. The dynamic always goes on. And to use my um, my category of fascism, because that's what we're seeing today. Uh, we may in a, be in a fifth wave of international terrorism, which is basically fascistic. We haven't decided that yet. Um, there, there's a yearning by the followers that is unsatisfied and unrecognized. The leader arises, he speaks to that yearning, he's got a fix uh, for it. They buy into that, they support him. Then they regard him as superhuman and they expect him to work miracles. Well, no human being can work miracles. I mean, Italy was invaded and Mussolini was hanged. Uh, you know, uh, Hitler wound up in a bunker. It's, it's a very fast rise and sometimes a very fast fall. And so based on that, I'm saying Trump lost from his peak of power. He, he did not actually uh, do the miraculous thing. He didn't get reelected. That's why he's so focused on it. He knows that takes his power as a charismatic leader completely away. If the people recognize that he failed, he can't afford to fail because once he fails, all of his power is gone. So he's trying to create an alternative reality and a message that they will believe. And as long as they perceive and they buy into his perception, then he will continue to have support. But Undoubtedly, he's lost a lot of people too. Well, yeah, I wanted to ask, you know, we've seen, uh, however, call it a fascist leader uh, over the years. Uh, and thank thankfully, a lot of them did fail. And I'm thinking of the, the demagogue in uh, Louisiana, Huey Long. He was actually shot um, at the end of his reign. Um, but I guess uh, what I'm really interested in here is how the charisma fails. What what are the what are the in indicators? Uh, I said if you lose an election, you know that's something. Uh, maybe people speak out against you, that's something. So the reality that you're trying to deny catches up with you, um, and, and I suppose putting that on Trump just for a moment, because we should talk about others too. But um, what are the indicators aside from the fact he lost an election and he's trying to create this alternative reality to hold on to his people? But what are the indicators that he is no longer um, as attractive and as magnetic to them? 
that they, and this is really the big question, that they see through him now. I mean, in the case of Jim Jones and Jones, Jonestown, there was like a couple of dozen people. In the case of Trump, it's many tens of millions, arguably as many as 70 million people who were all taken in. What's the sociological process by which they leave the fold and therefore diminish his power? Well, there's a, a, a basic formula for that, but it plays out differently in every case. So there's, there's, you know, historians never should predict anything. History always surprises. I know, but, but you're willing to do that with me, right, Jean? <laughs> I'm only <laughs> willing to discuss some of the formal uh, categories and theories and ideas that may lead us to understand better what's going on and what might happen what should happen. Okay, when he was president, he had the bully pulpit. He could, he had all, he had Twitter, he had everything. Everybody's recognized it since then that's been taken away from him. So he doesn't have the megaphone, number one. So he's lost power there. Uh, number two, he doesn't have the invulnerability that the presidency has. He may have a post-presidency invulnerability if the Department of Justice doesn't want to indict an ex-president and set a precedent. That, that would be wrong. And he also did not lose the people who do see through him, who are in the Senate and the legislature and the governors, a lot of them see through him, but they don't want to, um, they still want to ride whatever coattails he has because the party's falling apart. They can't get enough followers in the usual way. So they're trying to, through legislation and, and through Trump's coattails, to gain more supporters. But they see through him. If they were to let go, he would fall further. So thirdly, charismatic leaders always face challengers. It's like a David and Goliath thing. It's like the gladiators. They're gladiators of the of the socio-political field. They always have to show their power by beating the challenger. This is why Trump took down all the candidates in the way that he did. He's skilled at it. He's done it for his whole life. That's what he focuses on. Even as president, he wasn't president. He would say to people, go do this, go do that, while he held rallies. And we keep thinking, why is he holding rallies? Because he knows that power is where it's at and he's got to keep his followers. So he's got to keep them wrapped up and involved. So the degree to which he loses followership, the degree to which a challenger comes up and successfully challenges him, the degree to which people see through him, which a lot of them do, um, his charisma fails. Now, why don't more people see through him? They're invested in what? he stands for for them. They may not like him personally, but he is the only person they know of who can satisfy this itch that they have for knowledge and status that they can't achieve any other way, even though they may at the same time see through him. It's, isn't, isn't that just lazy? No, it's we do it all the time as humans, every single time. We put, we use the word, we put up with things, okay? Why do we put up with things? Because to some extent, we are still rational and we do a uh, risk um, analysis and it's benefit risk analysis. If, we, if our benefits are calculated higher than our risks, we'll take the risk. So you're an expert in religion. Yeah. I mean, and the implications of religion and, and religion and, uh, and its connection, for example, with terrorism. And so we talked about that before. What's the connection? You know, you've, you've given us the architecture of how this works. This, um, I'm going to call it uh, um, narcissism, fascism, charismatic, charismaticism, may I? <laughs> <laughs> What, where does religion fit in all of that, Jean? 
Well, there's an analytic definition of religion. Everybody knows they think what religion is, and it's from their own perspective. You know, it, it's prayer, it's church, it's God, it's belief. Um, but it isn't necessarily any of those things. In one case, it can be. One very large case, Christianity. However, what religion is, is, um, is a set of beliefs that you consider more important than anything else in the world. And that belief system is so important to you that you're willing to die for it. You claim you're willing to die for it. And you definitely feel you should be living by it. So you can have two kinds of Christianity that are polar opposites and people can be equally religious. Although one will say to the other, no, you're not religious. And the other one will say, no, you're not religious. So it's kind of a shape-shifting animal, but, the, but again, the pattern is what you look for. And the way people behave is the way you look for. Always in a group, religion's always a group thing. Spirituality may be individual, but religion is group. I just, uh, I hear you talk about these things and I think to myself that um, the whole thing is kind of a sine curve. What I mean is, uh, if you look at the 30s, there was a, an awful lot of people that followed uh, demagogues, um, uh, however you define them. And, and th th they were, they were in the millions. I remember Father, what was his name? Father McLaughlin? Coughlin. Coughlin, Cough, Coughlin yeah, in the Midwest in Chicago. Um, and, and he was a leader. A lot of people followed him. The radio allowed propaganda. And all of a sudden, you know, there were these huge crowds. I think the war, and of course, Hitler and Mussolini, and there were others, um, Stalin, um, they had they had control of of the, the thought process of millions and millions and millions of people. After the the war changed that, it kind of democratized it. It sort of crumbled them into smaller groups, maybe. <laughs> and 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 now after the war, we have the liberal order, and we don't have mm, big shot charismatic leaders like that anymore for a while. But now it seems to be increasing. Um, Putin is an example, uh, however he achieves it. Uh, Trump, uh, although he's um, kind of hopefully on the way down, um, and others around, and Xi Jinping, you know, these guys are very powerful and, and they have a lot of followers and they wouldn't be where they were without a lot of followers. So am I right to think this is this kind of sine curve? It comes and goes like a great big virus, a social virus around the world where sometimes you have despots, autocrats, dictators emerging more powerfully than before because of their charismatic characteristics and people's need to hear from them. Um, and sometimes it's less so. What are your thoughts about that, Jean? Well, probably pretty unsatisfactory because this argument is an old argument. It's gonna go on forever and ever too. And I'm not sure we're gonna figure that one out. Um, I have a colleague who is a real encyclopedic mind and he has spent his career basically cataloging all of these movements in the world. That's a, that's a lot. And he's a real expert at it. And when you say to him, well, don't we have more apocalyptic movements around the year 2000 because what it means in Christianity and the, in the Bible and all that? He'll say, no, it doesn't matter what's going on in society, whether people are anxious or the world is breaking down or building up, you're always going to have these groups. They're always there. They're the background noise. Now, let me make a very small analogy regarding your question about the, the waxing and waning of autocracy and autocratic leaders. Um, you recall 9-11, we all recall 9-11. In the 1990s, most people in the United States may not know this because the media was asleep at the wheel. The FBI was tearing its hair out because there were so many violent groups that were uh, attacking policemen 
that were murdering people, that were, there were bomb threats, there were robberies, there it was all kinds of stuff. There was Aryan Nation, there was the Order, there was uh, the Texas Republic, there were the Freemen, there were, you go on and on and on. Jonestown, it, it, it just goes on and on. And we had a low level insurrectionary fascist movement at that time, but we didn't know about it. Then all of a sudden around 9-11, it went underground. We didn't hear about it. It stopped. Why? Did 9-11 have something to do with that? Must did have. Our, did our consciousness just turn to other things? You know, like doctors say, no, this disease has always been there, but we've never really looked at it before. You know, and now that we're counting it, yeah, the sine curve goes up, you know? So is it something about our paying attention to it or, and it's always there? as my friend would say, or is it that there is some shocking episode or some historical thing that brings it about? Now, naturally, those who would say, okay, it must be 9-11, um, you know, you could look at France. France was invaded by Germany. And then all of a sudden you had the Maquis, you had the resistance movement. It wasn't there before. There were dozens and probably hundreds of groups. They weren't there before. They were only there because Hitler invaded. So yes, it's kind of an interaction between the two, I would say, Jay. My best guess is both that the conditions may be ripe for it, and it, it probably has a long prodrome to build up to it. I think we go back to Oklahoma City. We go back to before Oklahoma City to 1985 in CSA, and we see the whole building up of this um, radical right movement here. and. Uh, all of the things that poured into it. There are many streams that go into it, which is why it's a movement. Um, and it suddenly bursts out onto the mainstream. It can be that. It can be like endemic and then pandemic. And yes, the virus analogy is very good. I, I try to explain to people that a lot of the way I work and what I do is like virology. Yeah. Well, if you, if you, um, if you assume for a moment that there is a waxing and a waning and a sine curve, a sort of loose sine curve of sorts. My last question to you, Jean, is where are we on the <laughs> sine curve? <laughs> oh my, oh my, I wish I knew. You know, you always hope things are gonna get better, not worse. Well, I think Trump's sine curve peak. That's my thing. The GOP, it's still going up. They're finding usefulness with his ideological preconceptions, which are really Steve Bannon's, okay? So they're gonna use that. And also David Rappaport is probably on the right track here in saying it's just now time for the fourth religious wave of terrorism to dissipate. And now what we've got is this new ultra right wing autocratic uh, international wave of terrorism that's coming up. As to where we are right today, I'm afraid that we may be at World War III. I guess um, I guess that does wrap around uh, what uh, Mr. Putin is doing, um, and I wonder um, how, how where does he fit in all of this? Uh, is 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 he an example? Um, of a larger, a larger change, a larger sea change, a metamorphosis of sorts, uh, a sort of a, um, you know, a, a, a larger part of that curve, a larger, a more accelerated part of that curve. Uh, and is he catching? <laughs> um, I don't know what Putin's real base of power among his people is today, but. Um, I, I do think he is charismatic leader. He did not come up through institutional ranks because uh, the Soviet Union fell apart. Somebody needed to build a new order and he was one of the builders, maybe the major builder. And he has rewritten uh, recent Russian history. If you read his speech very carefully, you see how he is repudiating Lenin and uh, basically uh, following Stalin's role. So that's where we are today with Putin. Yeah, well, we haven't, we haven't even touched Xi Jinping, um, but uh, some of the things you said. 
Say? He's not charismatic. He's bureaucratic leader. Yeah. Maybe he's that's an autocrat. A he's, but the system, the system is autocratic. And he's come up through that system. Um, it, Putin's different. He made himself. Yeah. Gene, I love these conversations. We're not done. We, we have miles to go. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, Gene Rosenfeld, uh, right here at a treasure, right here in Hawaii, uh, with a whole um, lifetime of experience in, in in scholarly work. Thank you so much for joining us today, Gene. Thank you, Jay, thank you very much. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.